Thank you very much, uh, State's Attorney Alvarez. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> it's also very exciting news about the resurrection of the um, Hate Crimes Council. Very, very good stuff. My name is Lori Cooper, and I'm the commanding officer of the Chicago Police Department's Civil Rights Section. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next guest. Michael Masters is the Executive Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for Cook County. He was appointed to this position in May of 2011 by Cook County Board President Tony Preckman. Michael Masters is responsible for coordinating and maintaining the Homeland Security and Emergency Management across Cook County. And did you know that that's the second largest county in the country? It's a really good job. I got to know Michael Masters when he was the Chief of Staff for the Chicago Police Department. And we have a great relationship. He was definitely a mentor to me. And one of the things that I thought was really terrific that uh, Michael Masters brought was that he inspired the training academy to get all new recruits to go for a day of training at the Holocaust Museum. He also utilized tools from the Tools for Tolerance and brought in our strongest partner, the ADL, and he spearheaded that the ADL would create an online training the Chicago Police Department, which recently was rolled out. So Michael Masters, that's due to you, and we're very proud. So it's my personal pleasure to introduce to you Michael Masters. I was smart, I'd say thank you, and that'd be the end of it, because that's as good as it gets when you've got Lori introducing you. Thank you very much. The morning of this past April 13th was a particularly busy one at the Jewish Community Center in Overland Park, Kansas. In addition to its regularly scheduled activities, it was hosting a local singing competition. Just after one o'clock, however, everything about that regular day at the JCC would change. That's when gunshots rang out in the parking lot. That's when 73-year-old Frazier Glenn Miller began his killing spree. He began firing on a car entering the parking lot, striking the driver, then shot a 69-year-old grandfather, a doctor, who was taking his 14-year-old son to the grandson to the singing competition. The grandfather died on the scene. His grandson died later that day at a local hospital. The gunman fired several shots into the building and then fled, but his day wasn't over. Miller drove to the village Shalom, a Jewish community center just down the road, where he shot at several other people killing one. He was arrested shortly thereafter, and as he was taken into custody, he made numerous anti-Semitic statements indicating that it was his intent to kill more Jews. Interestingly, none of Fraser's victims that died that day, Dr. William Lewis Corcoran, his grandson Reed Griffin Underwood, or Mrs. Terry Lamano, were Jewish. Similarly, and equally tragically ironic, Evidence indicates that Wade Michael Page, the individual who attacked the Sikh temple in Wisconsin in 2012, killing six and wounding three others, including an Oak Creek police officer, thought he was attacking an Islamic mosque, not a Sikh temple. These are the types of individuals we face in our efforts to eradicate hate. Individuals who would as readily attack a synagogue, as a Sikh temple, as an LGBTQ community center, as a mosque, and individuals who often don't know the difference or care. Their victims often as diverse as their hatred. From homegrown violent extremists who are affiliated with foreign terrorist organizations to those associated with white supremacist movements to lone wolves and foreign fighters, the threats facing us as a nation are more broad, the connections more global, and the impacts more dangerous than ever before. Yet it is often the old enemies of hatred and intolerance that continue to pose some of our greatest challenges. Since September 11, 2001, individuals motivated by extremist foreign ideologies such as Al-Qaeda have killed 21 people in the United States. In that same time frame, white extremists, white supremacists, have killed 34 people in our nation. These individuals not only hold violent beliefs, but thanks to technology through chat rooms and social media, they can increasingly connect with like-minded individuals. How many of you are familiar with the website Stormfront? Quick show of hands. All of us should be. The website Stormfront has been linked to close to 100 hate-motivated killings in the last five years. 
The offenders in both incidents I referenced, the attacks in Kansas and Wisconsin, were each affiliated with white supremacist movements and had been visitors to the website. Miller had actually been kicked off the website for being too extreme. Imagine that. These individuals are dangerous to the entire community, across races, religions, sexual orientations, and professions as well. For often, it is the police officers, our law enforcement partners, who find themselves in the greatest danger due to these individuals. Officers like Lieutenant Brian Murphy of the Oak Creek Police Department, who was shot 12 times in that attack on the Sikh temple. Thankfully, by working together through strong partnerships, we can minimize these crimes and enhance our response to them. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here. I want to thank the commissioner and the commission. It's always a pleasure to share the stage with the state's attorney. Um, big shoes to fill, and I can't walk in heels. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, and as well as our partners at the Anti-Defamation League, and certainly all of you. Having law enforcement organizations and partners to recognize the importance of these issues, train their personnel to understand them, and then ensure good follow-up is essential. And one of our most critical tasks is training. As Sergeant Cooper mentioned, while I was Chief of Staff of the Chicago Police Department, we initiated specific outreach and coordination programs with the community to address hate crime issues. We placed the Hate Crimes Unit directly in the office of the superintendent and recruited highly trained individuals to serve in that unit. Individuals like Sergeant Cooper, but also like many of the fine men and women who are here today. This is a pleasure to see again after uh, not seeing so many of them for a while. But all of you as our law enforcement partners, I think you deserve a hand from us for the jobs that you do. Every day. We innovated a speaker, train, a speaker series where we trained thousands of issues on officers on issues ranging from extremist threats to cyberbullying, often with our partners at the ADL. I'm very proud to notice Sergeant Cooper mentioned that the Chicago Police Department and the ADL were the first in the country to develop online hate crimes training for all members. In May 2011, I was honored to be appointed by Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle to my current position. The same programs we innovated at the Chicago Police Department we have been building and expanding upon in Cook County because we have not just one department, but an entire urban area. And as Lori mentioned, it's very large. We've developed a comprehensive database of cultural and religious institutions within Cook County and we know how to reach them. Our 24-7 duty desk provides daily situation reports and current situational awareness updates on current threats, issues, and events. Consider the Sikh Temple shooting of August 5, 2012. Immediately after that occurred, our duty desk was in contact with the Sikh institutions in Cook County, as well as the local law enforcement work organizations and agencies where those Sikh institutions were based, providing relevant information to ensure a comprehensive and immediate response, enhance community police relations, and ensure officer safety. The sharing of intelligence is vital, but to do this effectively, we must have trust. We must continue to build up trust between law enforcement and the community. The community must feel that they have a partner. And so too must law enforcement, for these relationships have equally important benefits for police, who can come to be viewed more favorably, deservedly, and receive better cooperation. Consider the Boston Marathon bombings. Tamaril Sanayev had two outbursts at a Cambridge mosque that seriously disturbed the members of the Islamic community in that mosque to include the Imam himself. There was an opportunity for stronger relationships between the community and local law enforcement to report and act on this, relationship, on this information. But there was not a strong relationship. Relationships build up trust and understanding between law enforcement and the community as well as within the community itself. This understanding can have dramatic impacts on safety and security. I've been honored to serve on the Secretary of Homeland Security's Faith-Based Security and Advisory Committee with about 25 to 35 key leaders from the faith-based community throughout our country. We continue to see on a regular basis the targeting of our houses of worship, from African-American churches in the South to gay, lesbian, transgender community centers in the North and across the country. My department has been working with entities around the nation to include both the Boston and the Cambridge Police Departments on initiatives that build trust up so we can prevent the targeting of groups as well as houses of worship while providing training to our first responders on how to better address target violence, such as hate crimes. By building up relationships, we can work together to better understand one another. This leads to enhanced respect, more trust, and increased cooperation. The LGBTQ community, along with the Jewish community, faces, by the statistics, more direct threats than almost any other group in the city. 
First of all, we have to recognize that there are always gaps in statistics, so let's put that out there. But I, I would like to point out that I had the honor of working for Alderman Bernie Hansen, who is a member of the City Council, sponsored or co-sponsored several human rights and hate crimes ordinances, initiatives that expanded protection against discrimination in housing, employment, public accommodation, and credit to the gay and lesbian communities, as well as persons with disabilities. I was particularly proud to work with Bernie as he promoted the Gender Identity Amendment of 2002, which amended the Chicago Personnel Ordinance, the City's Fair Housing Ordinance, and the Human Rights Ordinance. The Gender Identity Amendment was a recognition that we have to be continually willing to expand our understanding and our models of acceptance, and to follow understanding with action. While Chicago in 1987 was the last major city to have a gay rights bill, we've made incredible progress through coming together as government, the community, and law enforcement. But there is much more to do. The reality is that if people are feeling targeted because of who they are, we cannot lose a moment of rest. Through strong training and good partnerships, we can increase the chances that individuals feel comfortable reporting incidents, and critically, that law enforcement both has empathy when issues of concern arise in particular communities and undertakes appropriate follow-up when issues are reported. As we see in many categories, from people reporting suspicious packages that they see on a street to recent reports regarding the underreporting of sexual assaults on our nation's campuses, it is my belief that we can do better collectively on the reporting, investigation, and enforcement of many of our laws in this country to include our hate crime laws. This is vital, as the diversity of threats we face increases, as well as the number of groups who are threatening us as a whole community. We have seen a 56% increase in the number of active hate groups in the United States between 2000 and 2013. Many of these groups and the statistics along with them spiked along with the election of our president. We also, as the state's attorney pointed out, have seen disturbing international trends, increased targeted attacks against the Muslim community, as well as the Jewish community around the world. These threats mean that we need to work together more diligently. Our department will welcome the opportunity to work further with any of you on our efforts, and we are honored to be here today. Robert Kennedy once noted that it is not enough to understand or to see clearly. The future will be shaped in the arena of human activity by those willing to commit their minds and bodies to the task. We have a group of people, our law enforcement officers, who do that every day, as do all of you who are in this room. And when it comes to addressing hate crimes, we all must commit ourselves to the task, because no person should have to be ashamed of who they are, or what they are, or be victimized because of it, whether their name is Matthew Shepard, James Byrd, or Ricky Bird's song. Because an attack on one community is an attack on all of us as a society. The JCC and Jewish retirement homes in Kansas were not merely Jewish facilities. They were community facilities. The same can be said for the Sikh temple in Wisconsin or the center on Halstead Street. So we will address the threats and attacks together as one. And while those threats are more real and more diverse than ever, working together we will not only address the threats that we face, but we can overcome them. And in the process we will make our communities, our county, and our nation more safe and more secure. We look forward to working with all of you to make that difference together. Thank you.